Hello, everyone, dear guests and uh, dear panelists, dear moderator. Thanks for all of you to be here and join us tonight. I saw many of you have been here before and also some new face. And uh, as the uh, art director of Times Art Center and also co-curator of the exhibition, I'd like to express my warmest welcome to all of you. Thanks to be here. And uh, for the first uh, episode, we already host a panel discussion between Ho Han Ru and David Eliu. And today is the last day of our second episode. We had the great honor to host a panel discussion between Li Zhenhua and Olaf Stuber. And uh, Marie-France Rafael will be the moderator. So Marie-France Rafael is the researcher in the university, Nim Tesius University of Fine Art and Design. And she's also organized and uh, make the concept for the last uh, video art midnight symposium. So tonight, uh, I have this great honor to have everyone here, and I will let all the panelists and the moderator come up to start the conversation. Let's welcome all of them. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you to this panel discussion tonight as part of the episode two towards autonomy uh, of the inaugural three-part exhibition, uh, The Detail, Video Art from the Pearl River Delta. And I would like to thank uh, Xi Bei for inviting me to moderate this discussion between uh, Lee John Sua and o Olaf Stuber. But before um, the panelists will give uh, an insight into their curatorial approach, I would like to give a few introductory words and then, of course, uh, introduce my guests. What is video art? And what do we mean uh, when we say video in the past, in the present, but also in the future? The Detail is a survey exhibition of video art produced in the Pearl River Delta over the past 30 years. As the curators Hu Hanru and Xi Bei of the show state, by adopting the medium of moving images, artists from the Pearl River Delta are looking for freedom and forms of resistance against dominant ideology and powers turning ordinary gestures into artistic strategies to construct diverse personal utopias." End of quote. Today, the continuous technologization and also digitalization that we are facing engenders new forms of art production and art reception of everyday culture, politics, and economics. But this technologization and also dig uh, digitalization also creates new spaces that can be described as virtual spaces that are equally powerful in their social economic effects reality to those effects of physical existence spaces. Taking up these ideas, we're going to focus in this panel on further investigating certain specification on time-based and technology-based um, art forms in terms of authenticity, creation, curation, and also distribution. In the digital era, we are not only facing new spaces, but also new images. And above all, we are dealing with a new way of seeing. Images are no longer objects, nor are they a fixed to define thing. Instead of that, images today can be described as a field of variables, a field of variables of pixels and dots or bitemaps. 
So again, what is video art? What is an image? And how do they relate to time? Of the medium, of the spectator, of art, for artistic engagement with and through media is constitutive for the continuing reformation of a discursive field in which the future anticipates the present. So I'm very happy to um, welcome again Lee, uh, John Soura and Olaf Stübel for this discussion. And I would like to just give a few uh, remarks on the biographies of both the, our guests. So Lee John Zura is a writer, a curator, an artist and producer, as well as the founder of Laboratory Art Beijing and the Mustard Seed Garden. He is actively engaged in the production, dissemination and critical discussions around new media and has worked with Chinese as well as international contemporary art and culture since 1996. He managed uh, his first international new media art festival, MAAP, in 2002 in Beijing. And between 2002 and 2003, he founded and organized the Illuminate the Great Wall Musical Festival. In 2005, he founded the Naples Far East Film Festival, uh, and the next year he was appointed executive producer of the Beijing International New Media Art Exhibition and Symposium. Since its inception in 2014, he's the curator of Art um, Basel's Hong Kong Film Program. But he not only curated many exhibitions, he's also a member of the International Advisory Board for the exhibition Digital Revolution at the Barbican Center in the UK in 2014. And he also um, published a series of texts. Um, between them, um, um, yeah, one of the publications, it's actually called Text with a series of your text. <laughs> uh, Olaf Stüber, uh, I think um, a few of us know him here in Berlin, is a curator, publisher, lecturer, and advisor for contemporary art with a main emphasis on uh, new uh, time-based media. And from 2001 to 2011, he directed the gallery Olaf Stüber with a focus on moving images. And already from 2003, it was one of the very few galleries asserting artists' film and video on the German art market. In 2008, uh, Olaf founded together with Ivo Wessel an international platform for artists' film and video in Berlin, the Video Art at Midnight. This monthly screening um, is, uh, is shown at the legendary Babylon Film Theater and offers a profound insight into the current video art production of Berlin's international scene. Furthermore, Olaf is the publisher of the Video Art at Midnight Edition and he also lectures and advises on video and artist film in the context of the art market, but also for video programs for uh, several institutions. So thank you very much for being here tonight. And um, just to give you a little idea, both of them are gonna um, present um, their work and uh, afterwards we will have a discussion and then we will also open to the floor. So thank you very much for being here. Who wants to start? Uh, maybe uh, Lee, yeah? Mm -hmm. Hey, hello. Yes, you can, you can hear me properly? Yeah. Yeah. No? Huh? Okay, do change to a project. I started with a project directly. Because it shows very much what, what and how I work. This is a show I curate in 2014. 
with a uh, Swiss artist, Roman Signa. This is the presentation of the show. And we have uh, 100 projectors, 204, and 205 videos show at the same time. And the time range is from 1975 to 1989. Um, and plus a new work that he really intend to show from his uh, kind of first big installation, performance work, uh, documentation of the video um, of the Shanghai Biennial in 2012. So, and the whole exhibition form that we developed it kind of together with the artist uh, for more than a year. Um, since end of 2012, I was kind of talking to Roman to have the possibility to show um, a kind of retrospective um, of him in China. Because my concern about his work was very much related to the Chinese contemporary art, uh, particularly in performance and video. Because his work been introduced in Hangzhou by the end of the 80s and early of the 90s. So for me, um, it's very important to kind of giving a reflection that how a Swiss artist um, influenced so-called the Chinese contemporary art. And also how a Swiss artist integrated into his uh, method of production that influenced many people internationally. And that was the idea. And also when the show starts, so we showed um, in Hangzhou first in the China Art Academy. And this is the second show right after China Art Academy. This is in Central Academy of Fine Art in Beijing. Um, then I was intent to actually completely document the whole thing that, and, and also upload it free for everybody. Because I think this is about sharing the knowledge and sharing the specific feeling of how video art can be presented and how history can be perceived and how things can be transformed. Because the show is still touring, and we have toured the whole show um, now to the sixth museum in Chengdu, in the Eiffel Art Museum. Until after the fourth time of showing it in China, and the fifth museum, or the Man Museum in uh, Sardinia, in Italy. And they wanted the show travel from China to Italy, and then now the show will go back to China. So for me, this is, again, a very important point of actually thinking about how curating can um, path through all different uh, locations. And also, that still kind of make a little relevant sense for everybody to understand. Um, yeah, so if you have got some time, because this is a project, a virtual reality kind of project to actually show it, but also I do believe this is part of um, our so-called my curatorial practice with artists. And also it's, it shows that how I develop with artists um, with shows, which I am highly concerned of this way of working, that I think you know, to contribute, to collaborate, and to co-develop, co-produce things is very essential. Um, and also part of my work is also involved in um, film, film producing. And I work closely with filmmaker and artists, um, try to help with developing ideas and maybe find a little money to, to actually do the projects. And back to what um, related to um, the Time Art cent Center here in Berlin, that with this show here, um, and I do think my, my Hong Kong project, sorry for that. Uh, 
to start again. <laughs> and apart from that, um, to think about how I work, um, this is also how I work. Because I think, as a professional curator, that the one typical quality is to deliver. And I think this is how I work uh, with Art Basel in Hong Kong, that we create a system together to deliver. But at the same time, I try to give an a input um, from another angle, like to think about Hong Kong in a particular location, and think about Hong Kong people and the transformation of the political situation in Hong Kong as well. Because I think it's very precious to think about that, because otherwise, a show just can happen in anywhere, um, like a, a parachute project. Uh, why we are presenting those works, why we're showing it in those different locations, I think apart from the so-called artistic art world, art system, kind of focused or related kind of meanings, there should be a lot of concern about why we're there and why the work have to be shown in there and what we kind of form the project and present it to the local people, what I think is very, very important. And that related to my suggestion to Xibei from the beginning, my topic was called the district artist dream. Because for me, this has become my kind of concern of thinking about what is the form, what is the, the situation for everybody according to the geographical understanding of it. So called a Hong Kong artist, a Hong Kong art scene, Berlin artist, Berlin art scene, or London artist, London art scene, what it's all about. So for me, this is very important that my project in Art Basel in Hong Kong, the film is, have always have a focus on you know, this kind of so-called impact of um, the Asian concept or the impact of Asian art development. Um, doesn't matter with Chinese or foreigners. Like for example, I'm showing also documentary film about Wu Li Sik, documentary film about Yao Qian from Taiwan um, to reflect on so-called what they understand about Chinese contemporary art in Hong Kong. And also I think that makes a lot of more sense of how we think about the structure in Hong Kong with AAA, with um, Radio Taj, with um, Taekwon, with M Plus, with many of the institutions, how they kind of dealing with it, um, with the situation of the so-called the Pearl Delta uh, area, but also to think about how they develop things accordingly, you know, um, uh, to the the mainland uh, China and also to Europe, to America, to to many other kind of. Uh, cultural aspects. So I'm showing one trailer. Um, I think the artwork always speak for themselves and also they're loud enough uh, to understand what I, what I mean. gave another 10 years as a, a title for 2017's creation because that was actually 20 years of return of Hong Kong. Um, but I don't want to mention that because I think 20 years uh, is too long. Um, and over time, it's kind of uh, passed through very fast. And 10 years is already something uh, I keep forget what I have done. And, um, and I think to, to mention that another 10 years is really like try to adjust to time 
to think about what happened in 2007. And if you're going another 10 years back, what has happened uh, in 1997. And for me, that's, that's very important to, to give this kind of time frame. Also, like, it's kind of recall of the memory of, of Hong Kong, um, but not, not only in Hong Kong. This is work from uh, Shen Xiaomin. I'm the producer of the film. Um, that was done in 2007, called I'm Chinese. But actually what he's tried to focus is on these um, immigrants actually from Russia to China. And they tried to merge into Chinese society since 1930s. So there were many groups uh, of them actually stayed at the Russian and Chinese border. Um, and they stay there as a Chinese, but actually they never really received um, a passport or kind of Chinese ID. They only have this kind of temporary ID that they still have their um, Russian name, but written in Chinese. Um, and I, I highly uh, really um, think it's very important to show this work because another 10 years is also addressed to this work that um, in 2007, there were a uh, filmmaker and artist concerned about um, this so-called Chinese identity, but actually a very complex uh, immigrant um, situation. Another trailer of uh, 2018. Thank you. 
I guess that's it. Uh, just two little projects, because apart from that, I work independently. I have a lot of other jobs, um, and I have to fulfill my my time. <laughs> Thank you. So of course, um, I will talk about Video Art at Midnight. Uh, it's still one of my most important projects, which I'm running now together with Ivo Vessel for 10 years. Uh, most of you probably know Video Art at Midnight, but not all of you know perhaps the history behind it, the idea. Um, let's start with my gallery work. Um, I had a gallery from 2001 to 2011. No. Uh, mm -hmm. The gallery was located uh, in Mitte, um, like most galleries in, at this time, uh, in this triangle between Volksbühne, Alexanderplatz, and um, Hackischer Markt was a small gallery, and uh, you see here the location. And my first show I did with Moving Image was in 2003 with uh, Thierry Geoffroy Colonel. Uh, and if you s look a bit more detailed, you see that there are still VHS um, slots in the um, monitor. So we started actually with VHS, uh, so it's not long ago uh, that we had this old. Um, media and um, but when I really started with video was with Corinna Schnitt and this was very interesting because uh, Corinna Schnitt was well known at this time through her films in film festivals but also on the art in the art scene but she hadn't sold any work until she had me as gallery owner as gallerist and uh, as soon as we made this show museums came and bought I can't say like hell, but really a lot. And it was really astonishing. Not that I, it was not that I was a good gallerist. Uh, it was uh, only that there was a point of sale. And the people understood, oh, wow, we can buy also film and video. And this was so interesting. Um, also, um, that because no, everybody told me that it's not possible to sell video arts. And I learned that it was not true. Uh, it is possible. And um, so it goes further and further. Um, more and more artists working with video came to me. Um, we worked together with uh, Samlung Götz in Munich to develop uh, contracts and certificates and all this stuff. And I had the feeling there's a new market. There was only one other gallery in, uh, in Germany who was focused on moving image, was Anita Beckers in Frankfurt. And all other galleries I knew didn't care about film, video. And so it was a kind of pioneering work. And this was really the, the point where I said, OK, it makes sense to go further in this direction. This was my gallery at the Art Cologne. I had, uh, like all other galleries in Berlin, to visit um, um, at least four fairs per year. Uh, without going on fairs, you have no chance uh, to be visible. You, uh, you have no chance to bring uh, your artists to new collections. Um, and that was actually the point which broke my neck a little bit, these fairs, um, because a fair costs at least 15,000 euro. And if you have four fairs per year, it's 60,000 euro. And uh, it is very, very difficult to sell with your work on fairs. Uh, for example, this was fair at Art Cologne. Um, Knut Klaassen, we showed only one film, and uh, people entered the room. They looked very briefly into it and said, oh, great video, great artist. I come later to see it uh, in the whole length, but nobody came back and nobody bought. And this was often the experience that uh, I was on fairs and I didn't sell anything. And uh, after 10 years, um, the last show was uh, Antje Majewski and Mathilde Terheine. Uh, I closed the gallery because uh, it was not economically not uh, 
reasonable to, to run this, this space like, like I did. During this time, I already, already invited artists and curators to show video works in programs. I had uh, panel discussions in the gallery, and, uh, but the room was smaller than this. Um, so perhaps 30 people fit in this room, and then there was a point where people were queuing outside. And I said, okay, I have to find a new place. And one night I was standing in front of the cinema, of the Marvelance next to my gallery. Uh, I said, wow, that would be great to have a cinema. Um, all chairs are already installed, the projection is installed, you only have to come with your DVD or something like this, and then you can start. And so I entered the cinema and uh, met the manager, Timothy Grossman, and told him, oh, I would like to show um, video works, artworks in the cinema. And he said, oh, great, sounds good. And I said, yeah, but um, I'm a gallerist, and gallery owners normally don't ask for entrance fee. If you make an educational thing or a curational thing in your gallery, don't, you don't ask for entrance fee. Uh, actually, I don't want to ask entrance fee in the cinema either. Okay, uh, and uh, I'm a young or a small gallery and uh, I don't have any money and I can't pay the rent for um, cinema space. And then he said, okay, then we have a problem. Um, and that was his idea to say, uh, yeah, then let's make it after the regular program. Let's try it 11, half past 11, something like this. And at this time I was reading a book about a movement in the 80s in uh, New York and in London, where underground film were premiered at midnight. Um, midnight Cinema was called. Um, Jodorowsky and Andy Warhol and whoever were premiered at uh, midnight. I said, okay, what they could do in New York in the 80s, we can do in Berlin anywhere else. Of, of um, and um, so we said, okay, let's do it at midnight. And then we looked for the name. And then I was standing in this huge hall. Uh, the scale from three, 30 places to 500 places was quite big. And I was a bit scared that I can't fill the cinema with my audience. This was a point where I asked uh, one of my best uh, collectors at this time, Ivo Wessel, uh, if he wanted to join this project. And he was enthusiastic from the first moment. He said, yeah, of course, I will, will be part of it. And we together found then the name Video Art at Midnight. We had other names in mind first, uh, Bitternachtspitzen and all these things. but. Uh, uh, we said, no, we show video art. Um, we know the discussion about video art, uh, but in this uh, context, it fit best, uh, we say. So the cinema is located, as you know, uh, next to Volksbühne, and it has um, all equipment we need. Now we have a new DCP projector. This was the old one. We have uh, film machines, uh, 35 mm, 60 millimeter machines, everything we know. Ah, this is the book I told you. Um, midnight movies, um, and here you see Ivo Bessel and me, and I don't know if this works. <laughs> quite simple. Uh, we invite artists to show their work in a cinema. It's always a solo presentation. Uh, we invite the artists that the artists show their works themselves. We help to uh, select the work uh, with the artists together. Um, but actually the artist is the one who decides in the end what they want to show. We say, okay, we have a window between at least 40 minutes and if it's possible not longer than one and a half hour because then it becomes very late, and um, 
it can be that people fall asleep or leave the cinema, uh, even if it's not the end. But if there are artists who's, who say, yeah, I need more time, I need three hours, four hours, five hours, it's also possible. We had this, Ming Wong, for example, had a long night of four and a half hour, or uh, Philippe Parino, also four hours. Um, nearly nobody stand until the end. Um, it's another story. Um, yeah. Cin the show works in the cinema is something very special. You see, we talk about the dispositive um, of a cinema that um, we enter the cinema together. We sit in a fixed place uh, in, in the, to the screen. Um, we are forced to see works from the beginning to the end. And that's something totally different than in an uh, exhibition context um, that we force the people. We say, OK, you come at 12 o'clock. There's nothing else. It's dark. Nothing happens anymore. You decide to come. So you, you stay. Normally, you stay until the end. And you see works, sometimes one work, sometimes uh, four, five, or six works by one artist. And after this time, after this screening, you know what Douglas Gordon is doing. Not, a lot of people know the names by artists, but not all works, or more works than only one. And that's the chance. And uh, that's also the chance for the artist. Here we see Douglas Gordon. And uh, even these so-called stars are happy about to have this, this possibility. Um, here we have uh, Candice Price. A lot of the artists take the chance uh, and make uh, premieres. They invite the whole cast and crew, like here, Reynold Reynolds. Other artists uh, make performances. Here, Chicks on Speed in front of their video collage. Um, other artists, like Alice Kreischer, uh, came with a whole seminar of uh, militant research with their students. All students showed their film. This was a night until 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, in the end, only the students were sitting on the stage to discuss about militant research. Um, others make also performance, like Eric Bünger. Or Julieta Aranda invited uh, an um, orchestra for contemporary music to accompany her work. Or Safi Sniper, he invited an, a VJ and had a VJ night. Um, so this is the list we had the last 10 years. Uh, this year we started with Julian Rosefeld, number 101. Sandra Schäfer was in February, now March, Biegert and Bergström, then Corbis Löffler, and then Hans-Peter Sonntag. Um, and I think it's a nice list uh, we had, have here together in uh, in these 10 years, and this is only a small part of artists um, I'm visiting, or I visited in their studios. Um, I think uh, I'm visiting at around two, three artists per week uh, to select then this, uh, this lineup. Here's some pictures, Ming Wong, the audience. Uh, we have around uh, 150 up to 500 um, visitors here, Andri Sala. We have also some curators like um, um, Wolf Herzogenrat, art critics, collectors, and the audience. And this is our most regular visitor, Björn Melhus, uh, who also held the, um, um, how do you say, um, Laudatio at our 10th anniversary. That's it, yeah. Well, thank you very much for both your presentations. Um, I thought maybe we could start the conversation by each of you uh, stating uh, your very personal definition of curating, especially curating film and video. I mean, you both already mentioned your work and uh, um, yeah, what your interests are, but I think it's also very interesting to know what it really means to you to create an art form that uh, can be described also according to uh, Siegfried Krakauer as an extraordinary means to represent and reveal reality. So, um, yeah, um, <laughs> Olaf, maybe you could start.
So for me, curating actually is inviting, inviting artists and make possible. Um, I like to give them a, a platform, to give them a, a window to show their work in the best way possible. Um, this is not always in a cinema, and it's not always possible in a cinema, um, but actually I'm not a real curator in this meaning that I have a, a concept, a deep concept, and I try to find artists to fill this concept or this idea. Uh, I go the other way. I go to the artist, I talk with the artist, I discuss with them, and I invite them and help them to show their works. This is my way on, of uh, creating, yeah. <laughs> so how would you describe it? Uh, I'm still searching for it. Uh, I'm still um, on my way to understand what means curating, because um, as m many people have uh, interviewed and asked, um, for me, there shouldn't be a definition of curating. There should be uh, many different ways of how people curate. Um, for example, some people say you should have um, um, an intellectual kind of concept in your curatorial practice. And I think so, yes, for sure. But sometimes, maybe this kind of intellectual input is too much interfering with actually artistic creation. Uh, how can we solve this kind of conflict? And I think, um, and also when you collaborate with many different institutions, commercial, non-commercial, um, artist funded or um, private company funded, they all have their different tasks. Um, then I think then curators should, as I mentioned, and deliver to deliver the, the quality work, but also in a certain balance of actually always on the side of an artist, but um, in a way always consider what would be the best for the presentation for the public. And I think for my work, um, I have to think about at least three different partners from three different directions, the artist, the institution, and the public. And of course, I think um, I work more in, the media art, more, more in the media art world, and my concern is about new technology and new art. So that means actually myself, I have to test it as well. So in my work, there's always important to think about how a show exists in, in the reality, have to be done also, have to be shareable, um, and might be contributed and manipulated also from the others online from, or from other places. So yeah, it's a very challenging work uh, to think and also like, through the presentation, through the representation, you have to always uh, also find um, and understand the um, the meaning of it. Um, I should not change too much of um, the artistic meaning from artists, but I should think about accessibility from all the others. Well, talking also about other places, as you just mentioned, uh, be they uh, real or virtual, um, you're based in Hong Kong, but also in uh, Zurich and in Shanghai and also in uh, Berlin. Um, how would you describe that this, uh, I would say, not being in one place uh, informs your working? Uh, also, um, yeah, be it also that you're always traveling a lot and, uh, yeah, not actually physically in one single place? Uh, I think this is our time anyway um, for my kind of people. Normally people call this kind uh, digital nomad. Um, but I try to do my work uh, as local as possible because there's a one project I did in 2015 
in Yekaterinburg in Russia for the Ural Industrial Biennial Contemporary Art. Um, and also, like with many other projects like this, I'd rather stay there for a month to really like merge myself into the, into the um, local people's life and also to actually execute and produce things on site. So that's, that was the idea for that time, the band in Russia. And we won the prize in 2016, uh, the best regional prize um, in Russia. So I think this is something I highly concern, um, you know, to actually think about where I came from. Uh, I don't know. I think this has become a, a little bit um, a question kind of fitting out of my direction. Um, and I, re I, I rather like to say it like where I should be, you know, where should I go? <laughs> yeah. And I think this is yeah, important, you know, when you work um, and when you kind of live in the time now, you have to always ask the question, why are you doing this? And what are you doing for? Um, and where, where would be the ideal um, destination for it? Yeah. Well, Olaf, um, I mean, you're also traveling a lot, but uh, you've also been in Berlin for uh, a long time with your gallery and now with uh, Video Art at Midnight. And as we saw in your presentation, uh, we moved from um, VHS to uh, digital uh, images and pixels. But uh, how would you describe that the uh, Berlin art scene uh, evolved in all those years? I mean, you saw That's, a lot of yeah. artists and you saw the city changing. Uh, you had your gallery in Mitte. Now we're here at uh, Potsdamer Straße. Yeah, maybe you could say something about the art scene and also the art public. Uh, first, I would like to say something to the traveling. Mm -hmm. um, I like to be in Berlin. I've been here for uh, since 1993, and actually, I like to to dig to dig deeper and deeper in an art scene. Um, I have to aim to know every artist who works with uh, moving image in Berlin. I will not succeed in because there are so many. Um, but I like it to, to go from one to the other and to, to dig deeper than only being for one week somewhere. And I was traveling the last uh, years quite a lot with, uh, a lot with Goethe Institute in India or in, also in China, in Hong Kong. And I also saw there a lot of video works, but to be honest, it was not very intense because uh, I had no chance to show them in Berlin because I only have this format, Video Art at Midnight. Um, and so there was a kind of interest, but not like in Berlin where I go from one studio to the other. And all this, uh, this discourse with, uh, with the artist is very important, the di dialogue with the artist. And uh, that's also kind of a uh, language problem, perhaps sometimes, um, um, yeah. And the art scene in Berlin, of course, it changed. I think we all know it, uh, it changed uh, immense. Um, uh, when I started, most galleries were in, in Mitte, um, Linenstraße, Auguststraße, there was Neugerimschneid in Charlottenburg, it was the only one um, from the really contemporary art galleries, but all others were in Mitte. And uh, then we had this hype. Uh, we had a lot of galleries opening. More and more artists came to Berlin. We were hip. And then uh, some years later, now it, it's calm, calmer. Um, it's not so interesting anymore. The prices rise um, very strong. I hear galleries, they can't afford their rent anymore, like here in, uh, um, in Potsdamer Straße also the prices rise, double the price for the gallery spaces. Uh, and this of course changed the galleries, the changed the, the program of the galleries and also um, the amount and the, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you both already mentioned it a little, but uh, you often work uh, with institutions, but also for institutions. For instance, uh, um, Olaf, I mean, you had your own gallery and uh, you created uh, your uh, 
I would say, own institution with uh, video art at midnight. But it's interesting because you went from an uh, art market oriented to, I would say, a non-profit uh, kind of institutions. Whereas uh, in your case, um, you work for uh, Art Basel Hong Kong, which can be, of course, described as um, a structural context which is very closely <laughs> related <laughs> to the art market. So um, how would you both describe um, this um, challenges you deal with or you face uh, with those different kinds of uh, institutions? Uh, maybe you start. Um yeah. um, before 14, 2014, uh, I have no interest in galleries. So my work is always dealing with institutions, non-for-profit institutions. But then I think, yeah, maybe I should learn, learn to know a bit how things function um, in the art galleries and also in the art fairs. Then I got this requirement from the um, funding director, um, Magnus, and he asked me to be the curator for the film in Art Basel in Hong Kong. And then I said, yeah, only if I learn. And I do learn a lot to understand how things function and how gallery and artists function in this sense. But then also I have to say, the market is not always a market you're looking into. The market is part of, part of us. We have to invent it as well. Like um, when I select those works and present them, that's also helping to construct the market. Because from my part of uh, curation, there's also no, I would say, uh, direct money involved. Because I, I think for the galleries, they treat it like uh, a promotional event. Um, so my film sector is free, and, uh, and there's no, you cannot make any deals on site. <laughs> And maybe the galleries are interested in presenting the work also on, at their booths, but uh, who knows? And I think I'm interested in this so-called um, the market of the future. And also recently I have this dialogue with my colleagues. I said the same because even today many artists are um, or could um, get very good uh, money from their artwork but still not in the videos, and still not in the video art scene. I think many artists are still kind of struggle for making good work and try to convince the best gallery to collaborate, or museum to collaborate, or all of us to collaborate, but still this is, um, so far from what I can see, it's not uh, the market yet. And I think we should yeah, for this sense, I think, um, apart from this, deliver a good quality of um, program. And also, I think we are part of kind of shaping it um, with the galleries and fair together. So for me, it was, uh, I lost the burden <laughs> when I closed, uh, closed the gallery, actually. Um, and now I have much more freedom to, um, also to, to talk about art and uh, to have a, uh, to, to meet artists and, uh, and talk with artists. Uh, I hadn't the time during the gallery. It was always planning the next show, the next fair, uh, to make money, um, always running behind some art, uh, 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 collectors to, uh, to sell artworks. Uh, and it was really high pressure. And uh, there are, uh, there are Galleries, gallery owner who make it probably better than I do, um, and um, and they are very important still. And there is no other model than the traditional gallery model. I think we can talk about the future of the art market, but I don't think that there will be so much change uh, because it's still this kind of uh, personal connections between um, gallery artists, gallery collector, gallery museum. Um, but for me, it was not the right job. Um, so I have much more freedom now. And um, yeah, it makes more fun. And I have the feeling I make more for the art world and for the artist uh, as freelance curator than as a gallery owner. 
But do you share this uh, opinion that um, the future of uh, the art market is not going to change so fast? I mean, you work also a lot in this Pearl River Delta in Hong Kong, but you also have this um, animation film festival close to Hong Kong. I mean, would you say um, also in terms of distribution, uh, getting to see these video works um, that, uh, yeah, um, what is the future, the future of yeah, video art? <laughs> For me, the future is now. So if you're not working on it, there's no future. And that there is always a future that if you really push it ha and make things happen. And for my projects, like uh, anyway, in the 90s, let's talk about the Chinese contemporary art when I first stepped into, you know, um, in the 1996. There's no market at all. Only after 10 years, I think in 2005, only a few people got into the market. And then I realized, ah, interesting, some of my friends getting really rich, um, but most of them still not. And then you see another change, maybe after another 10 years, then you start to talk about, you know, international galleries, start to talk about um, important museums, Winnie's Biennial, Documenta, and so on, so on. With all these kind of uh, name, and I would say, um, points of, of knowledge. And how can you think, uh, how can you link them together? And how can you think about the, the whole thing as a one market? Um, which I think is very important. To actually think, you know, to, to try to have a, a little bigger picture of um, how things function. And I think many artists still kind of fighting, and many, as well as many curators and galleries, are still kind of fighting under um, position to survive. And I think this is still the majority. And uh, only very few people get around uh, with no problem. Then I think, okay, what's new in there? I mean, every time, every, every era, every whatever, um, um, in our history, it's like people struggling. Um, and I think then it's really like um, what would, what, what would you do uh, in this time and, and to, to help with this kind of development and to really understand it? Because a lot of people talk about the market and I realize they have no idea about market because they don't know um, how market functions. Like for example, how the auction houses functions, how um, the banks functions in the um, like art-related banking, and how um, blockchain, for example, functions uh, nowadays. Because last year I was joining a, a conference in Basel, and I have to say this was not, I'm, I'm not uh, very happy with it, because they didn't really talk deep enough about how blockchain functions with, with art you know, in a, the big framework of art. But they just like name it like a, a fashionable word. And everybody's talking about blockchain, but it related to a little bit of a knowledge I understand. Um, I'm not saying that something I don't understand is more important, but I'm just saying it have to be understandable, but in a way it have to give you a different future. And I think Far from that, you know, to understand how the whole art system functions, you have to understand how locally they're functioned. Like, for example, how art is gathering here, how art, art gallery function here, how the collector, what they collect um, in this local area, what they support. Um, and then you have to think about uh, why they have the others, you know, why they invite us to be here, why the Time Art Center to be here to tell people about pro data pro robot data and about this area, why it is so important, what we want to share. And, and I consider that all in, in the whole so-called um, sphere of the market. I think it's very interesting what you just mentioned because um, I think those are also topics that uh, sometimes should also be addressed already in art academies because uh, 
from my own experience uh, teaching in art academy, you realize that those students are absolutely not prepared for <laughs> the real life uh, of the art market. But um, aside from that, um, I mean, Olaf, you also do a lot for distributing uh, video art. You created your uh, own video art uh, um, edition. So uh, how, why, I mean, is it uh, in mm. part also related to... Uh, there were two reasons. Uh, one reason was that I had to do with, uh, during Video Art at Midnight, with so great artists and only once, uh, every night only one time. and. Uh, I had the wish to work with some of these artists uh, longer and permanently. And uh, so, um, and then I was from time to time on panels and everybody asked me why on the art market is video limited on three or five or seven copies only? And why are the prices so high? It's really not the nature of video art, video or of video. You can copy it as often as you, as you want. Uh, it makes no sense to limit it on three or five or seven copies. And um, that, okay, then let's try to do something else. Um, I will ask all artists I showed during Media Art at Midnight, step by step, if they wanna give me one work which they never offered on the art market or which they wanna produce for the Video Art at Midnight edition. And I publish these videos in an edition of 40 plus 10. 10 artist proofs, um, they get the artists uh, to give them as present or deal with them a bit easier. An addition of 40 that I can start with a very low price with 680 euro. And for 680 euro, the collector or the museum gets the right to work, uh, to show the work in, in public. They get an archival copy, which they may transfer on another media. So they get all rights they need to have a really a real artwork. The only difference to the other ones are that there are, that there are, that there are more copies. And so, um, for example, one of the most renowned artists is Marcel Odenbach, Im Schiffbruch nicht schwimmen können, Foundering uh, You Can't Swim is the name of the work. And uh, Marcel Odenbach's works normally cost, let's say about between 20 and 30,000 or even more. And the same work now um, is exclusively in the Video Art at Midnight edition, uh, which started with 680 euro. So it's a more kind of democracy. Um, and uh, some artists say no, they can't, because the galleries um, say no. But Marcel, for example, he said, yeah, no, I, he liked the idea, because he's a pioneer of video art, and uh, um, in the very beginning of video art, this was not commercial. Video was done to be not commercial. It was a fluxus time. And, um, actually, this, uh, um, Klaus, you can tell a bit more about it probably. It was not done to make an artwork which goes to the art market. It was to, to under, um, however, underline the, 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 the art market. And um, so Marcel said, yeah, okay, I, th I think this is a great idea. And he gave his work and uh, he showed this work in a lot of exhibitions. Uh, it was very equal to all the other much more expensive works. And um, this is also interesting because I, always, uh, I uh, applied from time to time for art fairs to be part of, with this uh, edition at art fairs, for example, at Loop in Barcelona. And they said, no, um, uh, we don't like you. Uh, we don't like the concept. You destroy the market. You are too cheap. Um, and so um, it's very interesting also as instrument to re make research on, on the art market. Yeah. And now there are, I think, 25 works in the, in the edition. Yeah. So, um, yeah, coming back to what you said, that um, the future is now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what are your ideas of actually shaping this future now? It's actually, I have to find uh, other people and, and other system that um, they do not always um, believe in the system now. But of course, if I understand what is the system now, it's a, it's a big work. And you have to um, try it very hard to understand um, how things really functions and what is the real information you get 
how you analyze it, um, what you distribute, and uh, how you make this so-called a, a public impact um, in your work. So I think this is um, a big work. And I think um, I'm slowly gathering this kind of people together, but I'm still in search of them. And I think, yeah, I will find uh, quite uh, interesting people that could be validated in the future as well. Well, I would like to open the floor uh, to the audience also for questions. So are there any questions you want to address to Olaf or John Hua? No questions from the public? Last question, <laughs> only question. So I saw from John Hua's presentation, and you have this from 10 years now, and I also want to ask you this question and what, how you see yourself in 10 years, because you are two of you, because video art or multimedia is something changing so fast, and uh, how you will deal with the change and how you see the future. 10 years from now. Changement of technique or? Changement of technique, how you see your video art midnight in 10 years? Uh, <laughs> difficult question. <laughs> um, it's really a difficult question. Uh, also, that's also why video art has a problem on the art market because um, private collectors, but also museums, they are afraid uh, about the technique and the fast development. Uh, as I told that I started with VHS and uh, some years before we had automatic uh, tapes uh, and uh, you can see the uh, laboratorium by uh, um, Christoph Blase at uh, um, ZKM, how many machines he needs to make these works still uh, visible and uh, we don't know what happens. For example, I heard that uh, Apple will stop progress um, I don't know what happens then with all the ProRes files uh, the artists use now, or all archivals use ProRes. Um, what happens? Can we read it in 10 years? And even in 20 years, uh, what, what is then? Um, and 20 years is not a lot of time when we talk about art history. Um, so it's or also the display technique. It's so developing so fast. Um, we don't know. And we try to, on the art market, not to talk too much about it, not too afraid, not more, the artists, uh, the collectors, not more. So there is one question, yeah. <laughs> but uh, maybe you have, uh... okay, yes. Le cinéma moderne et... Uh... So the modern cinema? <laughs> yeah, the cinéma a utilisé énormément des techniques découvertes par les chercheurs, comme ça. So cinema used a lot of uh, techniques and technologies uh, that were discovered by, by founders, uh, by researchers. Mm -hmm. In a commercial, commercial way. Comment eux maintenant peuvent-ils avancer en sachant que systématiquement leurs créations seront euh, utilisées commercialement mais sans eux? So how, yeah, how can there be a, a kind of progress knowing that um, what they found out will be used uh, in a commercial way. So what kind of progress is there still possible? Uh, you know, like, um, uh, yeah. Je veux dire que le cinéma commercial a utilisé des créations, des couvertes. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, cinema is taking up uh, like um, artistic uh, research discoveries, but in a commercial way, so. Um, how do you think that this uh, has an impact also on the further artistic creation? For me, as I understand, um, there's two people I highly appreciated. One is a filmmaker, Peter Greenaway, and he said the cinema is dead. So in the 80s, he tried to invent the interactive cinema. And another artist is Jeffrey Shaw. And he 
intend to invent many formats of how we see the world in the future. And it's so called the future cinema. And for me, they're the leading people always in the scene and always embedded, so called, in the market and also beyond the market. Gulav. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, there is another question. Oh, okay. Um, I have a question for both of you. You were talking about uh, trying to understand uh, how things work. I mean, I think you were, you, you were meaning um, the reality, commercial reality for video art. So um, I'm very curious about your experience, your, who you go through us to be experienced, and how you describe this uh, uh, commercial reality gallery of reality is working in Berlin and in your case in, in, in Hong Kong, I don't know, for you too. How would you describe? What is it that, uh, uh, yeah, this reality of gallery is uh, working already? How are they looking for? How, uh, how is it working? My career. <laughs> There are so many galleries and so many different um, models. I can imagine, but I consider every, every country or every city, or there are like main cities, which have like a kind of cut. You, you, you say in Spanish, like it's cut by the same scissor. I mean, you, you have like, like, like a way of. I don't know. Is it, I think is it we, were, we were in a quite luxury situation here in Berlin because the rent were quite cheap. And so uh, a lot of galleries could run a quite exper experimental model, and they had not to to sell that much. Then, for example, New York gallery. If you go go to a Berlin-based gallery, and then you go to New York in a gallery, you see a totally difference. That they are much more um, they much more the need to sell, um, and this gave a lot of freedom in the beginning in in. Berlin arts art world, I think, and uh, um, that's the reason that the better ex exhibitions were here in Berlin than uh, in a lot of other cities, uh, where the exhibitions were made to sell. Um, I, I remember very well the first uh, fair, the first art forum I took part, uh, my colleague said, make no selling uh, booths. If you make a selling booth with a lot of uh, easy selling, sellable works, you will not uh, be accepted in the next fair. You have to make a statement. And this changed totally. There's no statement booth anymore on nearly no fair. Um, hmm? Yeah. And uh, this changed. And, uh, and this was, but this was an idea or a, 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 a specific of the Berlin art market in the 90s and also in the beginning of the 2000s. Answers your question a little bit? Or? Okay. Well, one question was a parallel between mainland China and Hong Kong then? Like Hong Kong like being expensive probably like New York and mainland China now maybe not that much but 10 years ago was also like really cheap to establish places there. Uh. I think, it's, anyway, it's a parallel, but also it's at, uh, um, I also treated like a whole, um, whole culture scene. Like also, we are not far um, between Germany and China as well. So what the culture scene here, like for example, in year 2000, 2001, there was one biggest Chinese show landed in um, the, uh, Hamburg and Bahnhof Museum. And also in the early 90s, where Andreas, uh, David Allert, uh, Hans Van Dai, and many people involved um, in a big show in um, Hakavi as well. So I think, you know, there's always this so-called way of understanding the others, but as well as you absorb from the others um, at the same time. That's also this cries of um, the human history. Um, um, I treat it in this way because um, I always address to 
one of my German friends, see Frisinski a lot uh, with his media archaeology because in this in this those books he wrote, there's always um, a touch of technology, but also a touch of uh, humanity, and I think there should not be divided like that. Um, but strategically, I use that strategy as well from the beginning. But now I think it's not really um, bring me in a deeper sense of understanding each other. And um, I think that's the moment I'm thinking a lot of actually what the main concern like artistically from the artist and also what their concern of actually presenting things in Hong Kong, in China, in here, or in New York, uh, what the difference? Because yesterday I have to talk with my colleagues from New York. We try to, we try to invent a new, um, new festival there. Then I said, I want uh, the festival called the Tale of the Wind from Joris Evans because I'm highly concerned about how he involved in the Communist Party and how he involved, you know, at the, in the last film, actually questioning a lot. Um, to find the wind is a, is a metaphor. Um, the, wind. the Tale of the Wind. The Tale of the Wind. It's the last film from uh, Joris Evans. Um, and that was shot in 1988. And I think this is a very important work to understand how a European um, involved in the Chinese, um, not only cultural movement, but the whole movement, entire, maybe uh, in uh, Asian perspective from the 30s and 40s until the early 90s. So I think this is something I concern, but then my colleague immediately asked me, um, can we call it Chinese Film Festival? <laughs> I said, why? <laughs> and she said, yeah, because they're, you know, we need to target people. We need to present this proposal to people who could understand this is um, a festival like geographically um, targeted. Um, then I said, yeah, so then maybe we invent LGBT festival. And she said, no, no, there are already LGBT festival in New York, so maybe we do something different. Then I said, yeah, but, you know, for me, this is all this kind of a stereotype of thinking, how people have. Um, but how to break through, of course, we're trying. And I think, yeah, it's interesting. So uh, according to some kind of a business, business plan, um, or business battle that people would develop different proposals for different kind of people. And I think, yeah, why not? We should call it the Chinese Film Festival. It, interesting about the Hong Kong art market perhaps is uh, I talked with uh, here Warren and um, with uh, Sam Chen Yang and they complained about the missing art markets uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, they said 10 years ago there was no gallery and now there are only galleries from New York and from Paris, the blue chip galleries, and Art Basel is there. But the normal, normal artists, the Hong Kong based middle class, or how do you say, artists, they have nothing of the art market. Actually, they have no art market um, for, for their works. Uh, and um, this also tendency, I think, in the, in the art market in general, that uh, we have a very big gap between. Uh, small and young galleries who start and then the, the big galleries, the major galleries and there's a kind of co concentration on big galleries with a lot of branches and the, the middle class has to fight and uh, you see here in Berlin a lot of galleries closed, also good ones like here Aratia Bear, I don't know if, it's, uh, if it was an, uh, an economical uh, problem or whatever but she closed and another, a lot of other galleries too and um, we also we, we, have, we still have young galleries who open and they start and they work for some years and then they close, or they like KOW they make the step. Um, they have 
10 or 15 employees and they're big enough and they have a branch in Madrid and then perhaps in London and wherever, uh, they have the power to, to survive. Um, but as bigger the galleries become, as more problems they have to work with young and um, not that expensive artists. Um, if the works are too cheap, you can't afford a fair like Art Basel. Uh, you can't afford big spaces. You have to sell a lot. You have to sell a lot of expensive artworks. Uh, and this is a problem we have at the moment, um, not only in Hong Kong, but also in the, the whole art market. But as I understand, if you even sell it cheap, you may not be able to survive. Yeah. Because that what I understand from the fair, that a lot of uh, this young or middle career kind of gallery cannot survive with their artworks no. because they're too cheap. No. Um, because this kind of game, or I should not call it a game, this kind of uh, business is a very, very serious business. And I think you have to, as long as you step into it, you have to really develop professionally and you have to get your mind really open for all possibilities. Because the market for me is not only the art fair or collector. There should be, there should be other people um, who can be involved in the, in the, in buying art or um, in the meaning of investing in art. Um, but of course, this is very difficult to find as long as you're step into the art world already. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah. This is something you need to really, um, you have to try out yourself because nobody can tell you. Even that I, I try to understand from big or middle or young gallery how they function. I still have to say, I still don't understand. A lot of, uh, a lot of this um, information they gave it to me, some of them are valid and make sense. A lot of them are not. And, and also with artists. So I think, yeah, this is somehow a, a market, but also very individual experience uh, to everyone. Yeah. So are there any other questions? Well, I think if there are not, uh, I would like to thank uh, Olaf Stuber and Lee jean for being here tonight. And uh, well, thank you very much also to uh, Xi Bay and Times Art Center. And um, yeah, thank you for coming and listening. And uh, I wish you all a very good evening. And uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Just very quickly at the end. So now if you want to see more video art from the Pearl River Delta in the next episode of The Details, the next opening is on next uh, Thursday, the 28th. So it's entitled um, The Politics of the Selves. And it's the third episode. So do come by. You're warmly invited. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.